Good afternoon. Um, I'm Angela O'Neill, and I'm here to speak to you today about women's health and neurology. Um, you've been hearing about a number of different uh, disorders, and I can't speak about just one disorder, so I'm going to sort of give you a different lens to look through uh, when you think about women, your women patients with neurologic uh, disease. I have no disclosures. Briefly, the history of uh, women's neurology. So you probably know that um, Brigham and Women's Hospital was a, actually happened when there was three hospitals, uh, Harvard hospitals merged. That is the Peter Bent Brigham, the Robert Breck Brigham, and the Women's Lying In Hospital to form the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So really at the conception of the hospital, women's issues were uh, key. And it was the uh, brainchild of my uh, former chair, Dr. Samuels, who decided to join two of our major areas of expertise, neurology and women's issues, to form the first uh, women's neurology program uh, actually uh, ever. So what is women's neurology? And I'm going to try to share with you by through some cases how to, how to think about this. So we have... Uh, neurologic disorders, which uh, affect women at different ages. Uh, for an example, multiple sclerosis. And what the issues are going to be for your women patients depend on where um, that woman is in her life cycle. So if she's a young multiple sclerosis patient, you're going to be thinking about reproductive issues. An older uh, woman with MS, you might be thinking about things like bone health. Um, then there's some disorders that only affect women uh, during pregnancy. Eclampsia would be an example. And certain kinds of strokes are much more common in pregnancy. So my objectives today are to discuss uh, sex-specific uh, disease concerns, the pathophysiology as it relates to sex, and treatment-specific concerns for women. And I'm going to use as an example multiple sclerosis, migraine, stroke in pregnancy, eclampsia, and then stroke uh, risk factors. So in a young woman, what are the issues that you really should be discussing? Um, first, I think family planning. So uh, the, the most important question I want to ask a young woman uh, is, are you planning on getting pregnant in the next year? Because that's going to inform how I approach treatment um, and certainly um, it will be helpful to discuss those kinds of issues with her early on. We wanna discuss medication risks in pregnancy. We also wanna uh, discuss the effects of pregnancy on the underlying disease and the converse, the effects of the underlying disease on pregnancy. This is the FDA pharmaceutical pregnancy categories. And I know we've moved away from that and we talk about risk versus benefit. I think in some ways this helps um, formulate my thinking a bit, and I'll just share with you some thoughts about this. Um, so category A, adequate, well-controlled contro human studies, no risk to uh, baby or mom in the first trimester. It's a bit of a fairy tale. Um, with the exception of magnesium, where most of the time pregnancy is an exclusionary uh, uh, criteria for most clinical trials. Um, the second thought I want to just to, uh, share with you is that we're trained that a B is better than C. Um, but the category risk really depends on the information that is known about the um, uh, medication. So, for example, clopidogrel is a category B, uh, but an aspirin a category C. Yet uh, the maternal fetal medicine um, uh, physicians have a huge uh, experience using low-dose aspirin uh, uh, in pregnancy. Other thing that you have to think about is that the uh, disorder, the medications change according to what trimester a uh, patient is in. So for example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications are category B in the second trimester, but become a category D in the third trimester because of uh, risk of uh, closure of the patent ductus arteriosus. And last is um, that whatever the risk is, is also re related to what the disorder is. So valproate, when it's used for epilepsy, is the category D. But when it's used for a more benign condition like migraine, it becomes a category X. So 
let's move in and talk about reproductive health and pregnancy concerns. And I'm gonna start with uh, some examples from multiple sclerosis. So here we have case one, a 28 year old woman, she has relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. She has stable disease. She's on interferon beta 1b in an oral contraception. So, and she wants to get pregnant. So which of these statements are true? A, pregnancy increases the risk of an MS relapse. B, neural axial anesthesia should be avoided in MS patients. C, postpartum MS patients need to resume their disease modifying therapies, so breastfeeding is not appropriate. Or D, pregnancy does not increase MS disability. The answer is D, pregnancy does not increase MS disability. So the uh, pregnancy relapse in an MS, in, in MS trial, which I'm gonna share with you in just a moment, clearly showed that the relapse rate one year postpartum is the same as the relapse rate the year prior to pregnancy. So multiple sclerosis disability did not change uh, related to pregnancy. Here are the immunomodulating agents that we use during uh, uh, for treatment of multiple sclerosis. I listed their FDA class, um, their half-life, maternal fetal risks, and excretion in breast milk. Just a few um, points on this. Glutaramer uh, acetate is actually quite safe. It's a category B. Um, there are some uh, neurologists who will actually continue this uh, during pregnancy. Uh, my MS colleagues do not, but and I'll and I'll share with you why. Teraflutamide is a category X. Now, it also has a very long half life, and you have to undergo uh, this accelerated charcoal elimination. So, this is not a medication that uh, really should be used for women in their reproductive age, unless. Um, all others have been excluded. And also interestingly that uh, if a man wants to father uh, a child and he's on this uh, medication, that he has to actually undergo the uh, accelerated charcoal elimination. Uh, last point was naltizamide um, um, has a 15 day uh, half-life. So usually they want to stop that with several months prior to uh, trying to conceive. And there is a rebound effect after you stop that. So oftentimes uh, the MS people will uh, have women on monthly prednisone um, uh, dosing uh, to, to try to prevent that rebound prior to conception. So what about what is what is the effect of estrogen on the immune system and uh, and how, what is the effect of pregnancy? So multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune dis disease that is uh, driven by uh, T cells, and in the non-pregnant state, there's an uh, increase in T helper cells, and that drives inflammatory uh, compounds which uh, destroy myelin and the underlying uh, axons. Now, pregnancy is a relatively high estrogen state, and um, it is a state of relative immunosuppression. And the fetus needs to uh, protect itself from being rejected, basically. And that what happens is there's actually an increase uh, in T suppressor cells and an anti-inflammatory uh, response. Here's the uh, pregnancy relapse in MS trial that I said I was gonna share with you. This is a trial that was uh, published in uh, 2001, I believe. Um, and it's a prospective trial looking at patients with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. 254 uh, women were followed through their pregnancy. So if you look at the relapse rate, uh, the annual relapse rate the year before pregnancy, it was 0.7. During pregnancy, you can actually see that in the third trimester, the, the relapse rate goes down. 
There is a small bump in the postpartum period of um, going the relapse rate going up to 1.2, but one year postpartum, the relapse rate is essentially the same. So again, this um, demonstrates the fact that pregnancy had no um, overall uh, effect on the annual relapse rate and disability was uh, uh, stable. What about breastfeeding? Well, first, who's at risk? Well, from the PRIMS trial, we can see that the uh, women who had poor, um, a high relapse rate in the year before uh, pregnancy, there and with the postpartum increase in relapse, those are the women that would be most of uh, risk uh, to have a relapse. And those are the women we would uh, encourage to get back on their disease modifying uh, therapy early. Um, there are some small trials uh, looking at breastfeeding um, and um, a share. One of those 32 pregnant women were uh, with relapsing remitting MS were matched with 29 uh, uh, controls. And of the 52% of the patients with MS who did not breastfeed, they actually had a relapse rate of 87%. Um, so this is exclusive breastfeeding. Now again, there was a small trial. It wasn't um, it wasn't controlled for disease severity. Um, there's been several other small trials which I've listed there, all all um, supporting the idea that exclusive breastfeeding um, actually uh, is uh, helpful in decreasing uh, MS relapse. Um, and it may we we're not sure why. But it may be that the lactational amenorrhea um, is associated with decreased uh, risk. So let's talk about another uh, uh, neurologic condition, which is quite common, migraine. And think about this through the lens of uh, women's health. So here I have another 23-year-old woman. She has migraine without aura. She's now eight weeks pregnant. Her migraines had been well controlled with sumatriptan. She's now having her usual headache with nausea and vomiting several times a week. So the second question, migraines during pregnancy. They A, often improve by the second trimester, B, are not associated with any pregnancy complications, C, should be treated in a similar fashion as migraine outside of pregnancy, D, can be treated with botulinum A. All right, the answer is A, you guys are good. Um, they are often improved by the second trimester. So the epidemiology of um, migraine during pregnancy is that migraines, particularly migraine without aura, which is the more hormonally driven migraine, decreased by about 70% by the er early in the second trimester. This is a classic, uh, uh, picture looking at prevalence of uh, uh, migraine prevalence on the y-axis and age in uh, on the uh, x-axis. The stippled uh, line are women um, and the uh, solid line men. And if you look at that, the curves start to diverge at menor near around menarche and come back towards each other at menopause, uh, showing that women really have three times more migraine than men. Um, and so there's clearly a hormonal component uh, to uh, migraine. So to bring home the point that every, say 60 to 70% of migraines undergo remission, and again, this is often more common in migraine without aura. Uh, migraine with aura can actually come on for, uh, with high estrogen states. So usually it's migraine without aura. There is a small, as I said, small percentage of new onset migraine during pregnancy, and these are usually migraine with aura. And migraineurs do have an increased risk of preeclampsia and eclampsia. So the most important thing about migraine is to plan with your patient. Um, in, in general, um, we would want to do is non-medical things such as lifestyle uh, modification, um, 
stress management, that kind of thing that if, if we can, we generally go to symptomatic therapy and do not use uh, preventative therapy except with rare exceptions. Um, other modalities such as physical therapy, if there's a myofascial component to the headache or occipital blocks can be uh, used as well. And some of the neuromodulatory uh, devices are also uh, likely to be quite safe. Here's the, um, a list of some of the symptomatic medications that we use uh, during uh, uh, pregnancy, um, their level of risk and their breastfeeding uh, information. So um, a couple, just a couple of points. Um, the non we already talked about that they're category D in the third trimester. Um, they can be used in the second trimester, but I have to say I often avoid them because of you know, women sometimes forgetting where they are in their pregnancy. Metoclopramide is a very um, effective migraine symptomatic therapy and is safe both in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, we avoid the ergots. Uh, magnesium, as far as symptomatic therapy, if, um, it, it's only helpful symptomatically if it's given IV. The reason magnesium has the cat a D behind it is because with um, five to seven days of high dose magnesium, like for tocolytic therapy to prevent uh, labor. Um, there have been reports of rickets in the babies. Triptans we'll talk about, but it, they are category C, but we actually have a fair uh, amount of data supporting uh, their uh, safety. And then the new kids on the block, the ditans, the G-pants, we just don't have any information, so best to be avoided. Here are the preventative medicines, and, um, and you can see that none of them are totally safe. Um, we talked about valproid as a category X, uh, not only because of uh, uh, neurotube defects, but also uh, neurocognitive uh, uh, problems with offspring uh, exposed to valproid. Um, the CGRP inhibitors, again, no data on these. So in, in, in general, it, we have a benign condition, which is going to most commonly is going to get better. Um, so try to avoid symptomatic uh, therapy as much as possible. So I, wanted, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about triptans in pregnancy. So there, we do have some data from the sumatriptan, nartriptan pregnancy ratio rate, registry, excuse me. Um, there was about... Um, it was a 16 year registry, 680 some patients were uh, uh, followed, exposed to triptans and no major congenital malformations uh, noted. There's a lot of data from the Nor uh, from Norwegian mother-child cohort uh, where 70,000 women were followed and over 1,500 uh, triptan exposures. And again, no major congenital malformations noted. Um, there was a slight increase in bleeding risk uh, um, with um, triptans used close to uh, delivery uh, with about 500 cc's of uh, increased blood loss. But I think in general, we would think that these uh, look to be quite safe. Um, we don't have, um, again, and they're not my first line, but if a patient, a woman has intractable migraines and I know they have responded to triptans, I think it's a reasonable second, uh, second line. Migraines and postpartum, so the triptans are quite safe. Multiple preventative medicines can now be used as well, um, including the, many of the tricyclics and uh, beta blockers. This um, uh, LactMed is a great resource place. Uh, you just put the, any medicine you want to use in the postpartum period, and it will tell you about breast, uh, breastfeeding risk. So now we're going to go from talking about some of the reproductive issues uh, and neurologic, neurologic problems and talking about some pregnancy-related disorders. We're going to start with ischemic stroke. So here's a 28-year-old woman. She's G2P1 at uh, 30 weeks of gestation, last seen well at 10 a.m., and she's found in the ground. She's not speaking and not moving her right side. She's found at 10.50. So um, that occurred at 10.50. Her initial exam at noon, she's mute with a left gaze deviation and a dense right hemiplegia with an NIH stroke scale of 15. So here's your question. Which of the following statements is true of ischemic stroke in pregnancy in the postpartum? A, brain MRI, brain and neck MRA are the best imaging modalities. B, IV TPA should not be used in pregnancy due to fetal risk. 
C, head CT and CTA of neck and brain are the most appropriate imaging modalities. D, the causes of ischemic stroke during pregnancy and postpartum are similar to those that occur outside of pregnancy. So the answer is uh, C, head CT and CTA of neck and brain are the most appropriate uh, imaging modalities. So stroke is a neurologic emergency, okay? And in the setting of a neurologic emergency, the, if the, we need to do what is most appropriate to, to uh, with this condition. And so we need rapid imaging, rapid vessel, uh, both brain and vessel imaging. Um, and so the evaluation and treatment of stroke during pregnancy is should be in the most cases driven by the um, severity of the stroke and, and is, mo as, is really the same as in the non-pregnant state. If you know if the patient had a very mild deficit, you could consider an, an MRI and MRA. But the, the time is such a valuable commodity here. We would immediately do a head CT, a CTA, um, given the severity of this woman's stroke. The concern about um, uh, using CTs. There's two two uh, concerns. One is the deterministic effects. That's a that's where after a particular dose of radiation, there's a threshold in which you're gonna have an effect. And here's an example of a burn uh, uh, related to radiation. The, um, any of our uh, modalities that we use for um, imaging, including floor vessel arteriogram, are well below any kind of deterministic effect. The real concern is for what we call stochastic effects. And these are the, uh, an effect that there is no threshold. You either have it or you don't. An example would be cancer, right? Um, the cancer risk is related to who you are, if you're a child versus an older person and the dose. The, um, so this is the, the concern. So, so we're gonna go back to the patient. The patient actually had a head CT scan and then received a TPA. They then, then this was at an outside hospital. They had the uh, MRI, which you can see on the right, the diffusion wetted image, uh, and on the left, the uh, ADC. So there's a deep uh, infarct involving the lenticular striate arteries, and there's a cutoff of the middle cerebral here with the arrow. So, <clears throat> How do you, so again, um, what is the experience or what is the data to show that TPA is safe? Well, we only really have case reports because again, um, uh, pregnancy was an exclusionary criteria for the, uh, um, the NMDS, the, the trial that got to TP, that put TPA on the map. But uh, what, we, what we know is that for the most part, fetal, uh, for maternal outcome and, it, and fetal outcome uh, parallel one another. So if you if you have a sick mom and you don't treat her, baby's not going to do well. Um, so in general, um, we would again, as I said, treat mom um, according to uh, her stroke. If she has a mild stroke and doesn't require TPA, that's fine. But if she requires TPA, we would give it to her. As far as thrombectomy, there's even less data, but it's a similar kind of thing. Uh, again, only a, a limited case reports with maternal outcome when uh, given good and baby's outcome uh, mimics that of mom. Causes of ischemic stroke in pregnancy are quite diverse. Um, the, uh, what the most likely cause really depends on where you um, are seeing the patient. So at a tertiary care hospital, um, cardiogenic emboli and stroke related to preeclampsia and eclampsia are the most common etiologies. But there's other things that we need to think about, cerebral venous thrombosis, reversible cerebral vasoconstrictive disorders, uh, amniotic fluid emboli, choriocarcinoma. Um, but so it's a quite a diverse uh, a ca yeah, cause of stroke. Okay. So now we're going to go and uh, 
briefly talk about eclampsia. Here's a 35 year old lady. She's a G1, P0, at 31 and 5 sevenths weeks of uh, gestation. She wakes with the severe headaches. Um, she's seeing visual spots. Half an hour later, she loses her vision. Then she develops the, one of the worst headaches she's ever had and blacks out. Her blood pressure is 170 over 120, and she was transferred to our hospital. Here's the next question Preeclampsia is no longer associated with significant maternal morbidity or mortality, B, caused by abnormal placental implantation, C, not associated with long-term maternal sequelae, D, has no radiographic correlate, E, is defined by hypertension and proteinuria. The answer is B, it's caused by abnormal placental implantation. So um, the basically the cascade of events that initiate preeclampsia and eclampsia actually occur at the time of the uh, placental implantation. This leads to ischemia, driving hypertension um, and uh, causing endothelial injury. The proteinuria part of the definition is no long, has been no longer required as part of the definition. So, um, so the hypertension, but the pro proteinuria portion has been uh, deleted from uh, defining uh, uh, preeclampsia. Okay, so what are the red flags when um, uh, someone has um, headaches? And I think the, the red flags are these. One, a change in the headache character or pattern. So for instance, I saw a patient today who is uh, pregnant, has long-standing uh, migraines with and without aura, but reports um, a headache that happened about a month ago, which was thunderclap in nature, um, associated with severe neck pain and vertigo, none of which she'd experienced with her prior migraines. So that's a red flag. Headaches with characteristics of elevated ICP, those are wake-up headaches, headaches worse with cough or sneeze. New headaches, right? New headaches who've never had a headache before. You, most of you've got, um, heard about the definition of migraine or, um, or other uh, primary headaches, but new headaches, you have to be concerned. Headaches with, associated with elevated blood pressure, an unusually severe headache or thunderclap headache, abnormal neurologic exam, and those headaches are associated with other systemic disorders like a coagulopathy or uh, underlying cancer. Those would all be red flags for imaging. Um, here's looking at um, the headache type by um, trimester. So if you look at it, migraine is by far the most common headache that, that uh, neurologists see during pregnancy. It's just, uh, it's a very common primary headache. But the, if you look at the, when is, the, here's the danger zone, the postpartum, two thirds of new headaches in the postpartum uh, uh, period are secondary headaches. Um, so it's when the headache occurs during uh, pregnancy and post uh, or, or postpartum is very a helpful clue. Um, for example, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, or used to be called pseudotumor, is commonly, if it's going to occur in pregnancy, occurs with the um, rapid weight gain. And that usually happens with between the first and the second trimester. Headaches associated with preeclampsia and eclampsia are not going to happen until after 20 weeks. Um, cerebral uh, venous thrombosis um, is high, uh, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. Um, it's particularly uh, going to be a more problem as, as you get towards uh, delivery and in the postpartum period. And then postural puncture headaches, of course, if they're going to happen, they're most commonly uh, after neural, an neural axial anesthesia, so that would be in the postpartum period. So preeclampsia is diagnosed when um, a pregnant woman has high blood pressure with uh, at least two uh, 
separate blood pressure readings, six hours apart, of it greater than 140 systolic and more than 90 a diastolic. The 300 milligrams of proteinuria in the 24-hour urine sample is no longer required as part of the uh, uh, definition. When a woman has seizures and change of mental status, then we, then we call that eclampsia. So here's the pathogenesis of eclampsia. I pretty much guarantee you're not gonna see a picture of a uh, uterus in many neurologic talks. But um, on the far right is what's supposed to happen. So the cytotrophoblasts of uh, the um, invaginate into the uh, uterus and it go all the way into the uterine myometrium and they set up a low capacitance uh, maternal uh, uh, fetal placental unit. That does not happen um, when uh, eclampsia is going to occur or preeclampsia later down, down the line. And so that sets up an ischemic um, non-low capacitance unit, um, which drives the pathophysiology. So what, why are we concerned about preeclampsia and eclampsia? Well, preeclampsia is associated with uh, significant maternal and uh, fetal morbidity and mortality. For mom, the complications include abruptio placenta, uh, DIC, acute renal failure, stroke, hemorrhage, death, and long-term cerebral vascular and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Um, for the baby, the complications include premature delivery, low birth weight, hypoxic injury, and death. Sorry, this cut, cut off a bit, but um, the pathogenesis, so there's genetic factors that, um, that predispose towards some women having preeclampsia. There's also uh, immunologic issues um, that uh, predispose, but the core feature is that there's this uh, high, uh, the low capacity uh, placental, uh, placental unit is not, um, formed, and that sets up an ischemic milieu and causing endothelial injury, which drives, which, which is driven by hypertension. And then the, what happens depends on which end organ you look at. So if you're having uh, endothelial injury and you look at the kidney, you're going to get proteinuria. If you have endothelial uh, injury uh, um, in the liver, you get activation of the coagulation system and you get the um, hemolytic anemia, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets, the HELP syndrome. And in the brain, you, with this endothelial injury, you often get seizures, changes in vision, confusion, uh, vasogenic edema, and you get stroke and hemorrhage. And it turns out that um, the posterior circulation, we think, seems to have less ability to auto-regulate. And so um, these changes are more commonly seen in the uh, occipital and parietal uh, lobes, explaining why some of the, why the, the neurologic symptoms, the visual changes, the confusion um, um, that th these women commonly have. The, there is a radiographic a correlate, so you can see what's called the posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome associated with um, preeclampsia, um, and um, this is ca causes headache, seizures, changes in uh, consciousness, and visual disturbance. And here's an example of a uh, axial flare image with um, white matter changes um, consistent with the Pross syndrome with uh, white matter changes in the posterior occipital lobes. The treatment um, for uh, uh, eclampsia and preeclampsia is rapid uh, blood pressure control. Um, it did, libidol is commonly used, but it, calcium channel blockers could be used as well. And magnesium sulfate is used both for the prevention of progression from preeclampsia to eclampsia. That was uh, the landmark trial there. It was called the MAGPI trial. And then it's also used for eclamptic seizures. There was a, a big debate for years uh, between the neurologists and the obstetricians. The neurologists thought that uh, the obstetricians were um, out to lunch, that they wouldn't be using phenytoin, that, but instead were using magnesium. And then the, a big trial came out in 1995, which showed clearly that magnesium was uh, much more efficacious than phenytoin. All right.
So now we're gonna talk about uh, an example of postmenopausal uh, women's issues, and I'm gonna use stroke as an example. So this is our fifth case is a 76 year old woman. She has a past medical history of diabetes, has new onset of atrial fibrillation. She doesn't smoke, drinks one to two alcoholic beverages a week, has never had a TI or stroke. She's normal, tensive and not overweight. So what kinds of sex specific questions should be asked and what is her stroke risk? So here's the question. All of the following except are stroke risk factors in, in women. Um, atrial fibrillation, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, migraine without aura, and preeclampsia. That is nailed it. Migraine without aura is not a stroke risk factor. So migraine with aura is a stroke risk factor in women, but not migraine without aura. And atrial fibrillation, gestational diabetes, and gestational hypertension are all uh, unique risk factors for women. Um, so the uh, migraine with aura um, doubles your risk of stroke. It's The risk is still extremely small. It doubles it from 1% to 2%. Um, but on a population basis, this is an important uh, issue. But migraine without aura is not a, a risk factor for stroke. So <clears throat> stroke is still the lead, third leading cause of death in, in women. And usually when we think of uh, risk for stroke, we think of across most age strata, uh, women have a lower ischemic uh, stroke risk than men. Um, but in the, in the older age groups, and particularly in women greater than 85, women actually have a higher or similar incidence of ischemic stroke as men. And because they're older and have a longer life expectancy, their, their disability is actually higher. So it's a really a, actually uh, has a huge total burden of, um, of risk. So what about pregnancy complications and long-term stroke risk? So if you look, um, if this green line is sort of the threshold above which you're gonna have um, uh, symptoms is basically pregnancy is a stress is a, is a stress test. And it's gonna, and those women who um, have uh, complications related to the pregnancy, such as gestational diabetes, um, hyper, pregnancy induced hypertension and preeclampsia means that those were women who are at higher risk than, uh, than women who had none of those pregnancy complications. So for example, gestational diabetes, if you have gestational diabetes, your risk of having diabetes is 50% within the next five years. Um, hypertension is risk of having, if if you have pregnancy-induced hypertension, you have a four times higher risk of adding hypertension later. And preeclampsia at least doubles your risk of stroke 10 years or more uh, down the line. Here's uh, some data looking at some retrospective cohorts, um, which uh, looking at preeclampsia and stroke in later life. And, and the odds ratio is, Depend, is, dep of course, it looks at which studies are variable, but it's about double or in this last trial with very severe preeclampsia up to five times odds ratio of uh, stroke risk. So this is a huge place where as primary care providers, you have the ability to intervene. Atrial fibrillation is an independent risk factor for stroke. So those of you who use the CHADS VASC um, uh, 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 risk uh, calculator, you get an extra point if you're a woman. Um, and that came from several large cohort uh, trials. 
Uh, there's a large trial of over 100,000 uh, patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation in Sweden. And the incident risk of ischemic stroke was greater in women than men. So in, for women, it was 6.2% versus 4.2% uh, incident risk per year. It's not clear why that is, um, but um, clearly it's, a, it's an independent risk factor for stroke. So for, this, so for a woman over 75 who has, who has a new onset AFib, they, you know, they are much more likely to require anticoagulation. Because of the differences in uh, stroke risk for women versus men, the uh, American Heart Association and American Stroke Association came out with this paper in 2014. Um, it's extremely uh, detailed and well-written. I would really encourage you to uh, look at it. But basically saying that women who have preeclampsia have about twice the risk of stroke. And um, those with uh, gestational hypertension, at least four times the risk of developing hypertension later on, which as we all know is the, one of the highest risk factors for stroke. So again, trouble the risk factor for stroke and, and hypertension. Again, atrial fibrillation is an independent risk factor, diabetes, migraine with aura, and turns out depression and emotional stress may be uh, higher risk factors for stroke in women um, as well. How that is that because of secondary lifestyle uh, issues or not, it's not entirely clear. So I've taken you on a bit of a whirlwind tour of thinking about some of the uh, women's issues in neurology. We talked about a number of different disorders and how you can uh, need to sort of take a different lens uh, to look at those. And we, so for reproductive and pregnancy we, concerns, we used MS and migraine as an example. Pregnancy, we talked about uh, stroke and uh, eclampsia and preeclampsia, and then it used uh, ischemic stroke as a uh, how women are different than men as far as their risk factors. I'm going to end with this. I hope I've. I hope this has been somewhat helpful. But um, here's an attending at a tertiary care hospital, uh, explaining uh, in detail what's wrong with the patient. So hopefully, I've given you a bit more insight than uh, this faculty member. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention, and hopefully, I have time for some questions. Dr. Neal, thank you so much. That, that was really great, and you are correct. I, I didn't expect to see. Uh, uh, piece of a uterus uh, for neurology talk, but thank you. That was really great. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one of the questions had to, has to do with uh, migraines and triptans. Um, and is it um, a category X? You're cutting out, Galen. Um, okay, so migraines and triptans, are, are we talking about pregnancy? Yes, in pregnancy. So, so triptans are actually, they've been categorized as a category C. Um, I tried to show you some data to, to explain that they're actually, lo looks like they're quite safe from um, everything that we know. Um, it's pretty common for women, particularly in the first trimester, not to know that they're pregnant and to have used triptan. So we've there's never been any major congenital malformations associated with the triptan. Um, and um, I, again, um, I use them not as first line treatment for um, migraine uh, in pregnancy, but as the second line, and particularly those women who have refractory migraine who are ending up uh, in the ER on a regular basis. So, if you have, if you, the data is most we have most robust data for the sumatriptan uh, because that's the oldest uh, triptan. But um, um, I think that they probably are quite safe. Um, uh, Okay, great. Uh, the next question uh, for the pregnant patient, if proteinuria is no longer required, how do you differ between uh, hypertension and preeclampsia? Oh, really good question. That's my, I hear my maternal fetal medicine colleagues going back and forth all, on this all the time. It's sometimes very, very difficult. Um, so they use it as sort of a secondary uh, criteria, but it, it, I think it's um, it can be very difficult to distinguish the two. So part of it is timing when it comes on and the acuity and what other out things are going on too. So, but it, it can be hard. Next question, uh, are, 
uh, elderly women with stroke and atrial fibrillation at high risk of bleeding if they are on anticoagulation? Well, so being older puts you at risk for um, fall, um, but you have to fall a whole lot to overcome the risk of atrial fibrillation. So it turns out that the elderly actually are the people who um, benefit the most from uh, anticoagulation, and you have to have a very high fall risk. But I can put this back to you, Galen. What do you think about that? Because you're a stroke expert. Um, the answer is uh, yes. I think for those uh, women of low body mass index above age 75, there is a higher risk for having a spontaneous hemorrhage uh, on anticoagulation. But it doesn't negate the benefits overall of anticoagulation, but that risk is higher. So it is uh, worth a very long discussion uh, for that patient. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next question is... Uh, I guess it's the questions regarding clarification of what preeclampsia is in the pregnant patient. Uh, so two measurements of the systolic blood pressure greater than 140 during pregnancy, is that preeclampsia? If it occurs after 20 weeks, uh, again, um, yes. Okay, great. Uh, that's, that's all we have uh, right now for questions. Uh, for this section. So thank you so much. That was, that was really uh, fantastic.